Recently, my multi-tenant food ordering app got hit with a massive DDoS attack in which one of our merchants was specifically targeted. And I'm talking massive. In a matter of seconds, around 30 million requests got fired from thousands of IP addresses globally. And even though we had Cloudflare protection in place, some of that traffic still made it through to our origin server and caused downtime. To make things worse, this happened on a Friday evening, the busiest period on our platform. And as if that wasn't already enough, I was also on a holiday at the time. <gasps> turning this into a true nightmare scenario that I want to avoid at all costs going forward. Now, I know what you're thinking. Sabatino, you had Cloudflare protection enabled. How did this happen? Well, that's exactly what we're going to dive into today. Because here's the thing, having Cloudflare protection enabled doesn't mean you're bulletproof. And there are always lessons to learn when things go sideways. Before we dive in, I would appreciate if you like this video and subscribe to my channel if you're new here, and then let's go. So let's break down exactly what happened during the attack. In a matter of seconds, we were hit with around 30 million requests from thousands of IP addresses across the globe. Now, Cloudflare did its job. It mitigated about 98% of that traffic, which sounds great until you do the math. 98% of 30 million still means 600,000 requests made it through to our origin server. Our load balancer had to serve 600,000 requests in a matter of seconds, and because all these requests were hitting our homepage, Nginx had to communicate with a PHP FPM process for every single request. PHP FPM can only handle a limited number of concurrent processes, and by default, it's usually configured for maybe like 50 to 100 processes per server. So when 600,000 requests start piling up, Nginx starts to queue all these requests waiting for PHP FVM to become available. This creates a massive backlog and memory usage starts spiking because Nginx has to hold all these pending connections in memory. At the same time, CPU usage goes through the roof as the system desperately tries to manage this queue. Eventually, we got hit with the too many open files limit because each queued connection requires at least one file descriptor and the whole thing just collapses under its weight. If these had been requests for static assets like images or CSS, Nginx could have handled them directly without ever touching PHP. But with homepage requests, every single one needs to go through the full PHP stack, and that's where our bottleneck was. Now, we monitor all our infrastructure components using better uptime, that's our three application servers plus our load balancer. If one of our app servers goes down, it's not ideal, but it's not an emergency, as we have redundancy there. But our load balancer is our single point of failure, and when that goes down, everything goes down. And sure enough, at 4.30 p.m. on a Friday, peak dinner ordering time, my phone starts buzzing with emergency alerts. I'm on a holiday, trying to enjoy my evening, and suddenly I'm getting notifications that our entire platform is unreachable. On the map, you can see the attack take place as all order activity stops for around 20 minutes and eventually resumes. Now, there was one silver lining in all this chaos, our database didn't crash. While our load balancer was choking on all those requests and our PHP FPM processes were maxed out, our database server was actually handling things very well because we cached things aggressively. This meant that once we got the attack under control, we didn't have to deal with data corruption or a lengthy database recovery process on top of everything else. So now let's talk about how we actually responded to this crisis. The good news is that triaging the issue wasn't too complicated and that's entirely thanks to our uptime monitoring setup. We monitor all of our application components separately. When I got the downtime alert, I could immediately see that our individual application servers were still reachable. They were responding to health checks just fine. This told me that the problem wasn't with our Laravel application itself or our database. The issue had to be somewhere in front of our application servers. So I quickly checked our load balancer metrics and saw that it was completely maxed out. CPU and memory usage were through the roof and our Nginx error log was flooded with the too many open files error. At this point, I knew we were dealing with some kind of traffic search, but I needed to figure out if this was legitimate traffic or an attack. That's when I jumped into our Cloudflare dashboard and there it was, a big red banner alerting us of an ongoing DDoS attack. Cloudflare's threat intelligence had already identified the pattern and was showing us real-time metrics of what they were blocking versus what was getting through. And this is where having proper monitoring and the right tools really paid off. Instead of spending precious minutes trying to figure out what was wrong, I could immediately see the full picture 
and start focusing on mitigation in a matter of minutes. After a quick investigation, I made the decision to hit Cloudflare's under attack button. For those who haven't used this feature before, it immediately puts your site into a high security mode where every visitor has to pass a challenge before they can access the site. And this worked. Almost instantly, the malicious traffic stopped hitting our origin server and our load balancer started breathing again. CPU and memory usage dropped back to normal levels and our legitimate users could access the platform again. But here's the thing. The under attack mode is not a permanent solution. It adds friction for your real users too, and more importantly, legitimate bot traffic like webhooks from Stripe or from our payment terminals were being blocked as well. So while this bought us a bit of time to dig deeper, this was definitely not a solution we could keep in place for longer than 10 to 15 minutes. With the immediate crisis handled, I could finally dig into the Cloudflare logs to understand what was actually happening. And that's when I discovered something crucial. This wasn't a random attack on our entire platform. Instead, the traffic was specifically targeted at one of our merchants. All 30 million requests were hitting the same merchant's storefront URL. Figuring this out actually was a game changer for a response strategy. Once I identified which merchant was being targeted, I could isolate their configuration and implement protections just for their subdomain, without affecting the rest of the platform. This meant I could take more aggressive defensive measures for that specific merchant, while keeping the experience smooth for all of our other merchants and their customers. Cloudflare has a feature called Configuration Rules, that lets you apply different settings based on matching expressions, which are essentially conditions that you define. For example, you can say, if the hostname equals merchant123.example.com, then enable under attack mode. After this modification, around 20 minutes into the attack, the platform was able to resume its operation normally because I turned off the global under attack mode and the rest of the evening went by with no more disruptions. After we did some crisis communication with our merchants, we could start taking our firewall security more seriously. All right, so now that we've covered what happened and how we responded, let's dive into the actual Cloudflare configuration and talk about how you can set up your defenses to handle DDoS attacks more effectively. The first thing to understand is that Cloudflare's DDoS protection works on multiple layers. You got your basic DDoS protection that's enabled by default, and this handles the really obvious stuff like massive traffic spikes from known bad IP ranges. But for more sophisticated attacks like the one we faced, you need to configure additional rules and settings. The goal here isn't to show you exactly what we configured, but to explain the thinking behind each rule so you can adapt this to your own setup. Because here's the reality. Every application is different and what works for a multi-tenant food ordering platform might need tweaking for your use case. Let me walk you through the key areas you should focus on. We'll start with rate limiting, which is the most important rule of all. We didn't have any rate limit set up except for the ones defined in our Laravel app. But the idea here is to prevent the request from reaching your origin. So we have three rules set up. The first one is block after too many requests. For example, after 300 requests in a minute, the offender will be blocked for 24 hours. Next up, we have a timeout, which is basically the same, but with lower minutes. For example, after 50 requests in a minute, you will be blocked for one minute. Finally, we also have some rate limits on posting. For example, you can only hit or register endpoint 10 times per minute. And this is a pretty good measure to prevent registration abuse. Next, we have around 10 custom rules we introduced after the attack, and I divided them in three categories. Do note that the order is important, so let's start at the bottom. The first rule we have in place will block specific user agents, because when we got attacked, we saw a surge in traffic from specific availability checkers. This was likely the attacker checking to see if there were any holes in the WAF and to see if you could strike from other locations. Next up, we will permanently ban specific IPs for example, known offenders. Then we will block specific requests. This one helps us mitigate probing attacks where bots try to figure out which software and which software version you're running. We block access to everything prefixed with WP for WordPress. We block access to PHP files and files, etc., etc. Next up, we will block specific continents except for known bots like Googlebot. There's no need to allow the entire world on our platform because we're Belgian based, our customers are all based in Belgium. There's no need to allow the entire world. Then we created a list of essential countries, for example, Belgium, France, the Netherlands, Germany. 
and everything else is classified as a non-essential country. Our merchants like to go on a holiday, for example, to Italy, Spain, and these countries still get access to the platform, for example, to check the reporting, but they will be challenged. And finally, we enforce a challenge on specific pages, for example, the onboarding page or the login page for the merchant panel. Next up, we have our just-in-case rules that are toggled off, but can be toggled on when needed. So the first one, elevated security with block, is an aggressive measure and can block access to offenders to specific parts of the platform. Next up, we have the elevated security with a challenge, which is basically under attack mode, we can add a challenge to specific pages, subdomains, etc. Having these rules set up, tested, gives me peace of mind so whenever we get struck with another DDoS attack, I can simply flip the switch and isolate parts of the application. And finally, let's take a look at our bypass rules. These rules bypass some or all rules if they match. The first one is a whitelist of IP addresses, for example, our office. People at our office need a bit more access to the platform, so we bypass certain rules when the request originates from within our office. Next up, we will allow certain known and trusted bots, for example, or uptime checker, and we do so by passing in a secret string in the URL, for example, secret equals trusted bot, and we check whether or not the URL contains the secret string, and if it does, we can bypass certain rules. And much like the rule above, our webhooks get a special key that bypass certain rules, so we never block our legitimate webhook traffic to our platform. And the reason these rules are split out is because it makes reporting and analytics very easy. This one is kind of funny, but our application got rejected because the Google and the Apple App Store testers got blocked on the WAF, leading to some frustrating situations before I figured out the WAF was a culprit. By adding this rule in place, I ensure that both the Apple and the Google testers will never get blocked on the WAF and they can test our application successfully. Looking back, there are definitely some key lessons I want to share with you. First, I'm very happy that I did have Cloudflare activated on my domain. If I didn't have Cloudflare enabled, the incident would have been catastrophic. So if there's a single takeaway from this video, it's to enable Cloudflare or another WAF before you need one. Don't assume your current protections are enough, because we thought having Cloudflare meant we were covered entirely. Unfortunately, we learned that 2% of 30 million requests was still enough to bring down our entire infrastructure. Rate limiting rules and custom WAF rules aren't just nice to have, they're an essential part of your security. Next, monitoring is absolutely critical. Without monitoring or infrastructure components separately, it would have taken me much longer to pinpoint that the load balancer was the issue while our app servers were fine. And take it from me, that kind of visibility can save you precious minutes during an incident. Finally, having a plan before you need it makes all the difference. The under attack button bought us time, but it wasn't a long-term solution. Now we have those elevated security rules pre-configured, so I can simply flip them on instantly if this happens again, without scrambling to figure out the right settings during a crisis. Our merchants also appreciated the transparent communication during the incident and the fact that we published a post-mortem 48 hours after. If you're running any kind of production application, I highly recommend taking some time now to configure these kind of protections. Because trust me, you don't want to be figuring this stuff out at 5 p.m. on a Friday while you're supposed to be enjoying your holiday. And that's it for this one. If you found this content useful, give it a like consider subscribing and let me know in the comments if you've dealt with DDoS attacks before. I'd love to hear how you handled them. And with that, I'll see you in the next one.